the Zoom meeting. Uh, just let this all go well. And I pray that you find the devil, Lord. He doesn't like what we're doing here. Uh, it was apparent, Lord, the man sawing outside the door, uh, just the interference, even with the Zoom meeting. Uh, he doesn't want the word of God to get out. And I pray that you find him, Lord. Let this all go over without a hitch. And I pray everybody's able to get back onto the call. And I pray that you bless this time as I preach. And I'll thank you for it, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay, just one more. Uh, uh, for those that have called in right now, if you don't have your line on mute, please remember to put your line on mute so I can't hear you and, with the interference, okay? All right. Uh, if you have a Bible today, I want you to turn to the book of Acts, to the book of Acts. Today is Ascension Sunday. It's Ascension Sunday. This is 40 days after the resurrection. Okay, 40 days after the resurrection, Christ went up uh, into the Mount of Olives and he ascended up in their sight and they saw him go. So today I'm going to preach about the ascension of Jesus. And I'm not only going to talk about him going, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about <clears throat> him coming back as well. Okay, let's look in the book of Acts and we'll start in verse number one. Acts in verse chapter one, verse one. The former treatise, and you'll notice in the book of Acts, it says the Acts of the Apostles. A lot of people think that the writing is by Paul, but upon further investigation, it almost certainly seems that Luke is the one who uh, wrote the book of Acts. Because when you take a look at the beginning, you'll find the, the name Theophilus found here in the book of Acts and also in the first chapter of Luke. And if you know anything about Luke, Luke was the, he was a physician. And physicians pay important notes to detail, okay? They're very detailed uh, people. They learn to do that through their schooling, through their practice. They get very detailed. And Luke is very detailed. And some of the writing here in the early part of Acts is a lot like the beginning of Luke. We'll take a look at that real quick. I want you to turn or stay here. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many, and I love this word here, infallible proofs, okay? The word infallible means it's incapable of error. It, it can have no error. It's infallible. And we, we put that word with the word of God. The word of God is infallible. <clears throat> God is infallible. So these proofs were without error. So when people say, well, how do you know these things happen? They were infallible proofs. 500 people saw him at one time after he rose from the dead. And how many others witnessed of Christ? Okay. After his passion, the Bible says, by many infallible proofs being seen of them 40 days. And that's how we know the ascension happened 40 days after the resurrection. And speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Okay, now, I want you to take a look here because the word infallible eyewitnesses and all that pertain to the first three verses of Acts, we kind of find this language in the book of Luke. So keep your place in Acts, and I want you to turn to Luke chapter one. And I'm gonna to prove to you today that Luke wrote the book of Acts. So if there's any doubt, as to who wrote Acts, and like some of the books like Hebrews, there's a debate on who wrote Hebrews. Most attribute it to Paul uh, and say that he wrote it, but there's no author listed. So in finding out, investigating this, we would think that either Paul or Luke wrote Acts. But when we go to Luke chapter one, and again, keep your place in Acts, we'll go there. It says in Luke chapter one, verse one, for as much as many have taken in hand, to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us. Okay, so this should, this should give you confidence that what you believe is true, if you've ever doubted it. Okay, verse two, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were, look at this word, eyewitnesses, okay, and ministers of the word. So it's like the 500, it's like the infallible proofs, it's like being seen of them, uh, of him by many. All right, so eyewitnesses. It seemed good to me also having uh, had perfect understanding of all things from the very first to write unto thee in order most excellent Theophilus, same word found, same name found in Acts, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things 
wherein thou hast been instructed. So again, pays attention to detail. And he does that in the book of Acts as well. So go back to Acts and let's look in um, chapter one and verse number four. And we're going to continue on with the ascension. All right, it says in verse number four, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard of me. Now, if you're wondering and you're listening today and you say, well, pastor, what is the promise of the Father? The promise of the Father is the Holy Ghost. He would be the comforter and he would come at Pentecost. Now, for those of you who uh, don't know what Pentecost is, and I'm going to preach on that next Sunday because 10 days after the ascension came Pentecost. And we would celebrate Pentecost Sunday next week. So Pentecost falls in the word penta being the root word of five, the number five. 50 days after the resurrection falls Pentecost. So 40 days falls the ascension, the ascension of Christ, comes the ascension of Christ. And then 10 days later, which would be 50 days after the resurrection, comes Pentecost, when the Holy Ghost of Christ went at the ascension, the Holy Ghost comes down. So this is the ministry of the Spirit. And in the church age today, we are involved in the ministry of the Spirit. That's why the Lord works through the Spirit. You can't see things. You know, we have to believe by faith. The Lord doesn't do anything open before our eyes as far as manifesting himself. He comes by the Spirit, okay? So it's not by the eyes that we worship God. It's by faith. And we don't walk by, that's why the Lord says we don't, we walk by faith, not by sight. So a lot of people like to see, show me and I'll believe. You don't have to see. As the scripture says, the Jews require a sign. They want to see things. And the Greeks seek after wisdom. They seek after the wisdom. But we want to walk by faith, okay, by hearing. And that's where the word of God in preaching is so important. And that's why during this time right now where we can't come together as a church, it's hard for us. And a lot of Christians are are having a difficult time without meeting together. And I hope that when we can all get back together, we'll have joy together and, and, and we'll appreciate all that God has given to us as far as the fellowship of the spirit and the unity of, of the brethren. But it says the promise of the Father, that's the Holy Spirit, which saith he ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. Now I wanna tell you, if you got saved, if you're a born again Christian today, you have been baptized with the Holy Ghost. You don't need any second work of grace. You have been baptized with the Holy Ghost and you have all the Holy Ghost you'll ever need. So when you get saved, you get baptized by the Holy Spirit. That's what it takes to be born again. Okay, uh, it says in verse six, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Well, they were all excited because now he had risen from the dead and 40 days later, they said, hey, you're still here. Are you gonna at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, it didn't happen right then, okay? It's going to happen in the future. So we're almost 2000 years away from this event and it still hasn't happened yet, but it will happen. Okay, so it says in verse seven, he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the father hath put in his own power but you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So we are called to be his witnesses and every one of us need to be witnessing for our Lord. We need to be out challenging sinners about their need to accept Christ as their savior. Very, very important to do what the Lord commanded us to do before he ascended. He said, go out and the Holy Spirit's gonna come and it would lead us out into the world to win others to Christ and to be witnesses for him. So if you're being persecuted today because you're witnessing for Christ, you're in great company. And the Lord said that persecution would come. When you talk of Christ, the world doesn't understand that, you know, because we're peculiar people. We've been saved. We've been born again. The Holy Spirit abides within us. And it leads us down the path that God would have us as versus the world. Okay, so it says in verse nine, and when he had spoken these things while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. Now the word cloud there is very important because he went out with a cloud and in a cloud. So he went up and there he goes. And I can just imagine 
as he went up, he becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. And he said, wow, look at that. He's ascending. And all of a sudden, he got to a point, and a cloud received him out of their sight. He was gone. And they looked up. Where did he go? And all of a sudden, what happens, it says in verse 10, while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Now, the cloud is important because when he comes a second time, he comes with clouds. Okay, so he went out with clouds. The second time he comes with clouds. Okay, clouds are important. And it says in verse 10, while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. So this same Jesus is going to come in like manner. He went out with a cloud. He's going to come with a cloud. But remember this, for those of you who like to understand the advents, okay? And for those of you who don't understand that word, an advent in the scripture, the advent of Christ, the first advent was when Christ touched the earth. So when he was born of his mother Mary, that was the first advent. That was at Bethlehem, okay? Christ was on the earth. Now, before the second advent comes, before the foot of Christ touches down on the earth, which it will at Mount Olives, Christ is going to come with clouds, and at Mount Olives, he's going to touch the earth. And when he does, the Bible says that the earth is going to cleave and create a great valley. I believe it's in the book of Zechariah where it talks about this great valley from the north to the south and from the east to the west. And it's going to create a great valley there, just like a gigantic X had touched the earth. The foot of Christ is so powerful that when it touches the earth, the earth is going to rend from the north to the south and from the east to the west and, cre and create a great valley there. Okay, so we have Christ coming at the second advent. Now, in between this, and when he does come with the second advent, he will set up the kingdom promised to the Jews. And this was the kingdom of heaven. They were waiting for this kingdom. It's a physical, literal, visible kingdom. Okay, so they were waiting for it. Okay, now, before he comes, though, there is another coming. But this one here is not an advent. Okay, uh, we're going to go ahead and turn over to 1 Thessalonians. Uh, for those of you who just got on the line, please put your please put your phone on mute. Let's turn to First Thessalonians chapter four. First Thessalonians chapter four. First Thessalonians chapter four. And let's look in verse number thirteen. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse number 13. It says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Now, here's a coming of Christ, but here's the difference. This is not the second coming. So right now, as born-again Christians, we should be waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we're not actually waiting for the second coming. What Christians are waiting for is for him to come to the clouds. So he doesn't fully come to the earth this time. He comes to the clouds, okay? And there, in the clouds, a voice is heard. And the voice says, come up hither. And those that are in the earth that are, have died and are saved will hear the voice. And in the graves where they are, or at the bottom of the sea where they might have been, where all their molecules put back together by the Lord, wherever they have been throughout history, those that are saved will open up their eyes and their bodies will come back together and come alive. And they'll come up out of those graves and out of their burial places all over the earth. And they're going to come up to the clouds. And as they come up to the clouds, those that are alive and remain will also hear the voice and will meet them in the clouds. So when we talk about the blessed meeting in the sky 
and all of us getting together in one and rejoicing in the Lord, we're not talking about the second coming of Christ. We're talking about an event called the rapture, the rapture, okay? This would be where all the saints are called up to a meeting in the clouds. And in the clouds, we meet the Lord. And the scripture tells us that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, as we're going to read, the Lord said, don't sorrow. And these should be very comforting words to you today if you're saved, because you know that one day the Lord's coming to get you. Praise God. And we're all going to go. It says in verse 14, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Okay, so we're not going to go before them that are asleep. They're going to go first. And the Lord tells us this in verse 16. For the Lord himself, praise God, Jesus is going to come. He's going to come for us Christians to get us out of here. And we're going to go on to be with him forever. What a day that's going to be, as the song says. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. When I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. Amen. Verse 16, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ. See, in Christ. If you're not in Christ today, you will not hear his voice. So if you die without Jesus, your body's going to go to the grave. And as I've often preached and the scripture confirms, your soul's going to go to hell. And your soul's going to be in hell for the rest of, of eternity uh, until the great white throne judgment, until God casts you into the lake of fire forever and ever and ever. So you think about the plight of an unsaved person, terrible, absolutely terrible. They go to hell and they miss out on this great event. So if you're lost today, please, I want you to, I want you to fully think about what you're missing out on. You might have the world by the tail today, but that's all you have. Uh, Christian, you might have all kinds of persecution in your life today, but I'll tell you what, one day you're going to see Jesus as he is. And you're, come, you're coming up to the clouds and you're going to get a mansion on high. What God has prepared for us, we can't even think about it. it, can't, it, it we can't fathom all that's prepared for, for someone who, who is saved. So if you're saved today, you should rejoice. And if you're lost today, even though the world might be good to you and you might have it made down here, you better think about your eternal soul. You really need to think about that because you're not going to come out and you're not going to hear his voice as a Christian would. It says, and the dead in Christ, very important, the saved in Christ that have died shall rise first. Then we, we, wow, maybe it'll happen in our lifetime. I don't know. A lot of people say, Pastor, are you going to see the rapture? I don't know. I hope I do. But if I don't, I'll be one of the ones that comes out of the graves. And here's the voice. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together. We're coming out together. So if it would happen this morning, this church building is empty. It's only me and Pietro here. So me and Pietro would slap high five on the way out of here. We'd come out of the church. And those that are down there uh, at your homes, wherever you are, you could be down in Hopewell, or you could be listening from Anaka today, or you could be in Aliquippa, or, or somewhere in Beaver County, or even in Florida. I know people were listening from all over the country. And if you hear the voice, you're coming out. and You're going up to the clouds and we're all going to meet together in those clouds so it's, it's going to be like one point we all come together from florida and those that are saved from europe and from asia and africa and, and australia and down all the way to antarctica saved hearing the voice and the lord calls and we all go to that one point in the sky where christ is and we all meet together there what comforting words and it says then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, I wish I could hear the amen from all of you this morning because you've got to be reading these words saying, oh, man, you're making this sound so real, Pastor. Well, it is real, and it's going to happen one day. And we're going to go meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Okay. So we have the rapture. Now, when you think about the rapture, you say, well, all the Christians are going to go. The next step would be that Christ would return with us behind him. The Bible says his bride and it basically the honeymoon. 
where he takes his bride on a honeymoon and he says, come with me, my love. And he carries the bride down with him to the earth. And this is his second coming. So when you think about the second coming, the Christians will not be here. They will be with him, coming with him. Okay. Now, when he comes, he puts his foot down on the earth and people will say, okay, when does that happen? Well, we got a very good understanding from the scriptures when that happens. The rapture happens, and that, that is the next great event that we're waiting for. Once the rapture happens, then we know that Israel is greatly afflicted because a person steps up, and the person is the person of the Antichrist. And when the Antichrist shows up, he begins to deceive people, okay? And he begins to rule the world in a very dictatorial way. And it's basically this, you take my mark or you die. So all the lost that are left here that don't go out in the rapture have to endure what is called the tribulation. There is the tribulation and then there's the great tribulation. And I believe the tribulation is seven years. So after the rapture, the Antichrist steps up. And for the first three and a half years, he begins to work his magic on the earth. And he begins to make agreements with, with nations and with Israel. And Israel is deceived into believing that he is truly Christ. And the Lord tells us that in Matthew chapter 24, when they said, uh, what are the sign of that? What's the sign of thy coming of the end of the world? And Jesus says right away, take heed that no man deceive you. Antichrist is going to deceive many, he's going to come into the world and he's going to deceive the whole world into believing his government, his monetary system. They're going to speak uh, one language together, and I believe that's going to be accomplished through the computer. He's going to bring the world together as he is today. I mean, think about this, uh, what's happened through this COVID virus and, and all that they want to do. They can track who has it on the phone. Uh, you could put your bank account, your statements and everything in your phone. How quickly could it just go into a chip in your hand or in your forehead? where your bank account comes right out of your hand or your bank account comes right out of your forehead and there's no need for carrying any visa cards or any ID or driver's license. Just show me your hand and they scan your hand. What we thought 50 years ago wasn't possible, we know today to be absolutely possible and absolutely here. I mean, they put chips into dogs so they can track where a dog goes so we don't lose your dog. Could they do that to children next? I mean, think about the possibilities of technology and how the, how the Antichrist can rule the world through this. And basically he says, you take my mark in your, fa in your hand, right hand, or in your forehead. And this has all your information in it, right there. You go to the scanner grocery store, put it out, beep. You go somewhere else and you make a purchase, put your hand right there, beep. You go into a secure building and instead of an ID badge, beep, right over your head. You say, Pastor, I believe that. That could really happen. Well, the world's going to, it's going to happen. The Antichrist is going to make sure it happens. And he's going to say, unless you get my mark, you can't buy and you can't sell. How many people are going to start? How many people are going to say, I got to get that mark. I'm so hungry. You know, the Bible says that even the, the, uh, to our bellies, our God can be our belly. I mean, when you deprive your, your belly of food, what happens after a couple of days? You do anything to find food. After nine, 10 days without food, you do anything to eat. And how long would you go before even people on a deserted island, before they offer somebody up to eat them, to say, we're so hungry, we gotta eat one of us. You know, just never know the, the, the depravity of the human, human heart and human mind and what it will stoop to. And a person knows if they, if they get the mark in their forehead or in their hand, the Bible says that they'll be damned for all eternity. Now you say, well, where does it say that, Pastor? Well, I'm glad you asked. Thank you. I want you to turn to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians, just one book over, and I want you to look in chapter 2. Now, some people today may say, where is the promise of his coming? Ah, he's not coming. He said he was going to come. But the Bible says the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. He made a promise. As some men count slackness but as long suffering to us were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And we find in the same passage there that the Lord says that he's gonna come. And it says, for the Lord himself 
shall descend from heaven, of course, at the rapture, but he's going to come according to Second Peter, uh, where they say, where is the promise of his coming? Uh, and I, I'll tell you what we'll do. Instead of we'll stay in Second Thessalonians, but I want you to go to Second Peter so I can just read you this real quick. Second Peter chapter three. Second Peter chapter three. I'll give you time. I only have the two passages we're going to turn to, and I'll close it out with Second Peter, and then we have Second uh, Thessalonians, and I'm going to talk to you over there. It says Second Peter chapter number three. I'm going to make sure I get all these words right. Uh, it says in verse number eight. Uh, let's look in verse 9. Okay, Second Peter chapter 3. And I, I did quote these verses, so just so you know they're here. Go to verse 3. It says, knowing this first, Second Peter chapter 3, verse 3. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? I could just hear them saying, ah, where is the promise of his coming? He's not coming. He said he'd come. For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. And the Lord says that they're ignorant of this. For this they willingly are ignorant of. That by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth which are now, by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. So with God, time goes like that. You know, a day, a thousand years, just like that in the, in the mind of God. And then we get to verse nine. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but as long suffering to us for not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So today, if you haven't come to repentance, the Lord is willing that you would come. He can't force you. The Lord will never force anybody against their will. If you don't want to be saved today, you're going to die in your sin someday. And you're going to go, go to hell and open up your eyes and say, I made a mistake. I should have gotten saved. The Lord wants you to get saved. I mean, he's willing that you get saved. It's not him. The Lord is not going to force you to come to him. He wants you to come to him on your own accord. He wants you to come. He's standing there, the Lamb of God that can take away your sins. But unless you come to him, you won't get your sins taken away. You know, people say, well, I'm a good person or, or I'm a child of God. Listen, the Bible says that we are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. You've got to put your faith in him first before you become his child. Just because you're born into this world doesn't mean that, that you have the privilege to become a child of God. It's up to you. You know, if you die and go to hell, it will be your fault, not his. He did all the work that he could do. But it says in verse number 10, but the day of the Lord will come. See, he's coming. As a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Okay? He's coming. He's coming as a thief. And he's going to come on people when they least expect it. I tell you, that makes me so happy that I'm saved. I am so happy that my name is written in the book of life and that I repented of my sins. It's nothing that I did. When I get to heaven, I'm not going to pound my chest and say, I was good enough to get here. It's because of me. No. Uh -uh -uh. Whoa. Not because of me. I would put myself in hell. It's because of what he did. And I want to point to him and I want to say, I'm here because of what you did for me. And praise the Lord. He did that for all of us. Okay. He died for all men. Okay. Now I want you to turn to second Thessalonians and I want you to see the workings of the antichrist. And I'm going to talk about this and this is going to happen midway through the tribute while it happened at the beginning. Uh, with the day of Christ being the rapture, and then all of a sudden, enter Antichrist. He comes, and this is what he does. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him. So Paul here is speaking to believers. This is our gathering. So this must be the rapture, because it's our gathering. It's a gathering of Christians. That ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, 
neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So the falling away, and I believe that we're entering into the falling away. So many people don't go to church. So many people have left the precepts. And I, I witnessed to a person the other day, to this woman, and she says, well, I don't believe that you have to go to church to be saved. And I hold on to that. And I said to myself, what's wrong with going to church? If there were no preachers and there was no preaching, no one would get saved. The Lord ordained the church. He, he, he established the church so that people could come into the churches and hear the preaching and they could come to Christ. But Christians, so-called Christians, beaten down the church. We don't need church. What is it? It's apostasy. It's a falling away. It's an I don't, I don't give a care of what God says. Didn't the Lord ordain pastors? Didn't he ordain teachers and evangelists and apostles? Those were, for, those were gifts given to Christians. So this morning, this message and the preaching is a gift to you. This should uplift you. Something that you embrace and say, I love this. That's what a true Christian, somebody who's really in love with Christ and in love with the Bible and in love with preaching. I love this. Tell me more. I can't get enough. Okay, now it says, let no man deceive you about the, then it falling away first in verse three, the son of perdition. Verse four, who opposeth, see, he goes opposite, opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped. So that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now ye know what withholdeth that he, that's Antichrist, might be revealed. One day he's going to be revealed. And the world's going to embrace him. Oh, you're Christ. Yes, I am sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And the whole world follows him. It's crazy. The world won't follow the true God in the flesh. But when the Antichrist, the false God, comes in the flesh, the world says, oh, you're here for us. How deluded. You know, this is the way God works. God reveals himself to only those that really want him. To the rest, no revelation. It says in verse number six, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked, and it's a capital W on the word wicked, and it tells you that this is wickedness in the flesh. As the capital W on word in the Bible tells you, Jesus was the incarnate word. Antichrist is incarnate wickedness. He is totally wicked. He is the epitome of wickedness in one body. That wicked be revealed. So how can somebody so wicked come off as so holy? Think about that. How can a world embrace him and say, your holiness? You're the true God when he's the impersonation and the incarnation of wickedness. How people can be deceived. Now watch. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Oh, so much so that he calls fire down from heaven. You know, I just reflect back to us having trouble with this Zoom meeting, trying to get everybody on the same page. And I got a man outside the church that's sawing right now, and we had to move the pulpit and everything else. Do you wonder why, the, why we had such a difficult time trying to get this sermon together? Because we're exposing Antichrist, and we're getting people prepared for the end times. The devil doesn't want people to hear this. He doesn't want people to see what's going to be revealed. 
and, and how the Bible ex ex exposes him. He doesn't want people to hear this. He tried everything he could to shut down this message this morning. And hopefully you're getting a blessing out of it. And if you're not saved today and you're listening to this, I want you to understand that you are going to be deceived by this person. The scripture says that he'll show he have power and he'll show signs and lying wonders. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. You see, the love of the truth, that you might be saved from this. Now watch what God does. And for this cause, God sendeth them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. You're going to believe it. You say, well, I won't believe it. I heard this today, and I'm not going to believe that. If it happens, I won't believe it. I'll run from all that. I won't take the mark. The Lord says, don't take it. Because God will send a delusion upon you that you're going to believe a lie. That they all might be damned. I don't want to see anybody on this broadcast get damned. Listen, as a preacher, my heart goes out to you. I preach this message, and yes, I'm very direct and very honest from the scriptures. But in my heart, I don't want to see you go to hell. I don't want to see you be damned. I want to see you come to Christ in the worst way. I want to see you come to the cross and accept him as your Savior. It's the most important thing to me is that people listening to this are saved. It says that they all might be damned who believe not the truth. But had pleasure in unrighteousness. Today, if you're not saved, you take pleasure in unrighteousness. And it's no fault of your own. All you know are the motions of the flesh. All you know is to fulfill the desires of the flesh and of the mind and have pleasure in that because you don't know God. And if you don't know God today, you can't know Him. If you haven't accepted Christ as your Savior, the Bible says, today, behold, now is the accepted time. Now, if you're listening to this and you want to be saved, please pray with me and ask Jesus to save you. He will, and he'll spare you from what's coming. He'll spare you from what's coming, and he'll spare you from an eternity in hell. If you'd like to pray with me, the scripture says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Will you pray with me and ask Jesus to save you right now? Why don't you pray this prayer and mean it from your heart? Dear Jesus. I know I'm a sinner, and I know I'm in need of you. Lord, come into my heart right now. Forgive me for all my sins and save my soul from hell. Please, Lord Jesus, have mercy upon me as a sinner. Come into my heart and be my personal Lord and my personal Savior, and take me to heaven when I die. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving my soul. In your precious name, I pray. Amen. If you said that prayer, you made peace with God today. And when if the rapture were to happen, you now would hear his voice. And praise the Lord. That's how simple it is. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not might be, shall be. You got saved today. Now, as I always close this out, I want to say to everybody,